Theatrephonic presents Front Page Story. Written by Barbara Jennings. Gazette office, Abby Fletcher speaking. Yes, the crack solution will be in this week's edition. Yes, with an apology for the error. Thanks, bye. Abby, can I have a word? Have a seat and tell me what's been happening in this housing story. Well, I went to see Mrs Steele, who seems to be the driving force. She would be. Nice enough woman, but she collects causes like other people collect china ornaments. She's impressively thorough, Frank. It was more like being briefed by her than conducting an interview. She has a list of all the new housing built in the town in the past 15 years, categorised by size and price, and details of the housing waiting list for the same period. She's calling the campaign MASH. As in bangers and... Yes, standing for more affordable small homes. She thinks the planning committee isn't making that enough of a priority. And there are a few places she says are prime examples, especially a development by Jessamine Holmes on the eastern edge of town. Another one. The sort of houses my wife likes looking at in estate agent's windows. Dream on, I say to her. You don't get three bathrooms and parking for six cars and an editor's salary. Mrs Steele told me the original plans included a block of social housing which has never been built. And she claimed the developers shouldn't have got planning permission in the first place because that land had been mentioned in the council's planning strategy as suitable for a new health centre and minor injury unit. I checked the documents on the planning department's website and she's quite right. Was that an oversight or did someone influence the committee? Influence a planning committee? Never heard of such a thing. Should I follow it up? No, Abby, let it go. The houses have been there for 12 months now. Concentrate on the Affordable Homes campaign. Readers will be interested in that. Now, the way to present it is like this. Gazette office? Frank Donaldson speaking. Did you say Randall? Sorry, the the signal's terrible. Can you say that again? The museum, yes. Are you sure? Can you tell me what's gone? Hello? His mobile's cut out. Who was it? A Mr Randall said he was taking his little grandson round the Franklin Museum and noticed something was missing, stolen from its case. I couldn't make out what he said it was. Shall I get over there? Harry generally covers crime stories, but he won't be back for a couple of hours, so... Yes, you go, Abby, and see what you can find out. It'll be good experience. Thanks for making the time to see me, Mrs Dudley. I'd like to get the museum's angle on what happened. An exhibit was stolen during opening hours, and the police are dealing with it. That's all that needs to be said. But there'll be a lot of public interest. I just had a quick word with Mr Randall. Too quick, really. But he had to take his grandson home. Who? Oh, Mr Randall. The man who first noticed the carving was missing. And made a great song and dance about it when all he needed to do was have a quiet word with a member of staff. I must emphasise that I don't want whoever did this to have the satisfaction of publicity or to encourage any copycats. I take your point. It must be unsettling to have something disappear in broad daylight. How do you think the thief managed it? Hmm, Well, if we rule out supernatural intervention, I assume he or she waited until the room was empty, lifted off the perspex cover... Isn't it fastened down? No, it simply protects against dust and touching. Then they put it into a bag or backpack and walked out. There isn't an attendant in the room all the time. This isn't the V&A, Miss Fletcher. There is an attendant permanently in the pre-Raphaelite room where the most valuable exhibits are. 
and one in the local history wing. Two more patrol the other rooms. CCTV? It's in place, but unfortunately we're having some technical issues and it wasn't working this morning. Pity. And the carving is small enough to be carried out like that without attracting attention. Surely you know what it looks like. Ah, uh, no. I only moved here six months ago, when I got the job with the Gazette. And you never considered it worth your while to visit the town's museum? I intended to, of course. I mean, I still do, but what with one thing and another. I do know that Mr Franklin opened his collection to the public in 1952. The Gazette runs a monthly nostalgia corner feature, highlighting stories from a particular year, and I've been helping to prepare the one on 1952. We're using a photo of Mr Franklin and his wife with the mayor and the Lord Lieutenant who's doing the honours at the opening. Mrs Franklin looked very young. She was his second wife and, yes, a good deal younger. Aren't you getting off the point? Yes, sorry. The missing exhibit. I did try looking at the museum's website on my phone, but it isn't, um, very detailed. The tourist office is providing us with a temporary website. When I took over, the museum was in desperate need of modernising. A major refurbishment and a range of merchandise were my first priorities. The website will be next. Of course. You can't do everything at once. Perhaps you could describe the exhibit. Mr Randall said it's a fur cone and everybody's favourite. It's the carving of a pine cone with the scales open. Pleasing to the eye, but a dust trap, hence the cover. Carved in lime, which is a relatively lightweight wood, and about 25 centimetres high. It was part of Nicholas Franklin's original collection, and I gather it's always been popular with the public. That's why it's one of the images we use on our merchandise. And just checking my notes from Mr Randall, it was made by an artist called Ruta? No, you're confusing the artist and the title. The carving's called Ruta. It's a woman's name from the Hebrew for friend. We don't know why this particular Ruta was represented by a pine cone, but they've been used symbolically since ancient times, standing for fertility or eternal life, for example. Uh, right. Good job I checked. So, who was the artist? Gerhard Blum. Should I have heard of him? Probably not. He was Austrian, very talented, but died relatively young during the Second World War. His career hadn't really taken off. Could you let me have a photo? Of the carving, I mean, not Gerard Bloom. Speak to my secretary. She'll make your copy of the catalogue photograph. And I repeat, Miss Fletcher, I would urge the Gazette not to make a big story out of this. It isn't the sort of publicity the Franklin Museum needs. You did a good job on that Franklin Museum story, Abby. All the facts clear and succinct. Plenty of comments from local people. Readers like that. Nice ending too. The motives of the audacious individual who spirited away an object loved by museum visitors through three generations remain a mystery. I was quite pleased with that sentence myself. I'd have given you the front page if our MP hadn't decided to visit the far reaches of her empire. You can always tell when an election is in the offing. She gets an overwhelming urge to be photographed with small children and rescued hedgehogs. But the owner likes her to have the front page whenever she's here. You know, Abby, the owner wasn't that keen when I hired you. Frank, he said, if you must take on someone with no experience, at least get a local. Look, Mr Bennett, I said to him. I've been the editor of the Gazette for nearly 20 years and I reckon I've got a nose for a good reporter as well as for a good story. Abby may not have had professional experience, but she got what it takes, trust me. Thank you, Frank. How's the affordable home story going? I've set up a meeting with the chair of the planning committee. Now he's back from holiday. I haven't got very far with Jessamine Holmes, which built the houses Mrs Steele's so cross about. I can't get past their charming but vague press officer. Go back to the planning department and ask who they dealt with. 
You need to... Oh, that's my office phone. Uh, keep me posted. Oh, and let me have a look at the piece on the new design of the wheelie bins the council's bringing in. Will do. Gazette office. Abby Fletcher speaking. Good morning, Miss Fletcher. I, I just read your story about the museum. Yes. Do you have any information? Uh, in a way. Uh, at least I have the carving. You stole it? No. But you have it now? Yes. I'd like to talk to you about it. Could we meet? Uh, of course. Come to the Gazette office. It's in Bell Street. No. I would rather meet somewhere out in the open. Don't be offended, but I want to be sure the police aren't with you. What about the common? All right. Straight away? If possible. Say in half an hour, at the bench by that clump of particularly fine field maples. If the bench is occupied, I'll wait nearby. Look for a middle-aged man with a small grey beard. Okay, but you haven't told me your name. Hello? Wrong off. Anyone know what a field maple looks like? <sighs> Hello. Hello, Miss Fletcher. I'm sorry to take you away from the office like this. No problem. Great view up here. I still don't know your name, Mr... Uh, please call me Conrad. Okay, Conrad. Do you mind if I record our conversation? I would prefer not if you don't mind. Right. I'll stick with my trusty reporter's notebook. So, I don't suppose you have the carving with you? No, but I can assure you it's safe. Can you tell me who took it? I did. But you said on the phone you didn't steal it. No, I didn't steal it. Conrad, this isn't making much sense. Forgive me. I, I'm a translator, and years of finding the exact words to convey a meaning has made me overly pedantic. I took Ruta, but I did not steal it, because you cannot steal your own property. I'm not with you. Ruta belongs to me. Conrad, that carving has been in the Franklin Museum since the 1950s. Unless you're a remarkably sprightly pensioner, you weren't even born then. So I'll go back to the office and leave you to your fantasies, because I'm wasting my time here. Wait, wait, Miss Fletcher, please. I'm explaining this badly. Ruta belongs to me in the sense that it belonged to my grandparents and was stolen from them. By the museum? No, much earlier. By the Nazis. May I tell you the story? Go ahead. My grandfather was an architect in a small German town near the Swiss border. My grandparents were educated, cultured people, not wealthy, but comfortable enough to collect a few fine pieces of art. They had a painting by Kandinsky and one by Sonia Delaunay. And in 1931, they bought a carving from a promising young Austrian artist called Gerhard Blum. Ruta. Exactly. I said their life was comfortable, but that changed when Hitler came to power because they were Jewish. There had been anti-Semitism before, of course, but now it was policy. As things became increasingly unpleasant, they decided they ought to emigrate for the sake of their only child, but they were afraid of drawing attention to themselves because they had both been politically active on the left when they were young. Eventually, my grandfather confided in a Gentile friend who ran a large greengrocery business, and the three of them were smuggled over the Swiss border in a delivery van. To the end of his days, my father could not abide the smell of cabbages. I suppose they couldn't take their belongings with them, there were Nazi sympathizers everywhere, including in their apartment building. They had to appear simply to be going for a walk. Fortunately, it was a cool day, so it did not seem strange that they all wore their winter coats. My grandmother was a resourceful woman. She took her jewelry, what money they had to hand, their papers, including the deeds to the apartment, and sewed them all into the linings of those winter coats. That's amazing. What happened when they got to Switzerland? They stayed put for a while, but their goal was to get to Britain, where my grandmother had cousins who could help them settle. They sold some of the jewellery and managed to make the journey. Then war broke out, 
And in May 1940, my grandfather was interned as an enemy alien. What? But he was a refugee. You have to consider the authorities' viewpoint. He might have been a spy in disguise. My grandfather never resented it compared to what he knew or guessed was happening at home. Anyway, he was interned for eight months, then reclassified as of no security risk, and then released. But it was yet another trauma for my father. And what was your father like? He was not cold, but very reserved. He he was a lawyer, and all his passion went into getting justice for others. My mother had also been a refugee, but she responded quite differently. She embraced every moment that she had been spared to enjoy. Didn't your family want to go back to Germany after 1945? No. The memories were too painful. My father went back briefly just after the war. He was still only in his teens. He he had the deeds to their apartment, but no one was interested. The building was in ruins and scheduled for demolition. The greengrocer was still there and very pleased to see him. He told my father he had walked past their building the day after they'd left and had seen men in uniform carrying out paintings and boxes. Did you ever hear of the paintings again? My father became quite obsessed with them as he grew older. He got in touch with people who specialised in tracking down art looted by the Nazis, which had happened on an industrial scale. Eventually he traced the Kandinsky and later the Delaunay. He got them back? Not physically. They had both ended up in galleries, and my father didn't want to remove them from public view. But the galleries agreed to acknowledge their history and relabel them as permanent loans from my family. That satisfied my father. And Ruta? He never found any trace of it beyond the illustrated catalogue of the exhibition it first appeared in. My sister and I were not that interested, to be honest, it all seemed so long ago, and we didn't pursue it until after he died. But you did find it. Only by pure chance. I I wanted to leave London and I chose to move here because I'd been easy travelling distance of my sister and both my nephews. I went to visit the town museum, as you do when you're new to a place. And there was Ruta. I can't describe the shock. I thought it must be a very similar work. After all, I'd only seen photographs. But it really was Gerhard Blum's carving. Why didn't you talk to Mrs. Dudley about it? That would have been the sensible thing to do, and I'm usually a sensible man. I didn't even tell my sister. I I went back repeatedly and brooded about it, and then I became angry. Ruta sat there, just another exhibit in this man Nicholas Franklin's collection, and there was no hint in the guidebook of the injustice and the suffering connected with it, for my family and for Gerhard Blum too. He died in a concentration camp. So you took it? Yes. I went in carrying my guidebook and one of the museum's large cotton bags, the one with the picture of Ruta printed on it, put on gloves to remove the cover, placed the carving in my bag and walked out. The foyer was teeming with a school party. No one took any notice of me. So what do you want to do now? I want to give it back, with certain conditions. I wondered whether you would be willing to liaise with the museum for me. Why do you need a go-between? Reading between the lines of your article, Mrs Dudley may not think my feelings justify my actions. She may want to make an example. You're probably right. She wanted the whole story buried, but I didn't tell my editor that. I thought a neutral intermediary might diffuse the situation. And what are these conditions of yours? A promise that I won't be prosecuted, and an agreement to acknowledge the carving's past and ownership in the way it's described. Art doesn't exist in a vacuum untouched by history or politics. You must understand, Miss Fletcher, I'm not looking for any personal attention or publicity. Hang on, Conrad. I need my story out of this. You might get me the front page for the first time. Then you will act for me? Yes. Don't get your hopes up too high. I don't think I'm Mrs. Dudley's favourite person. But I'll give it my best shot. Thank you. The big question is, can you prove all this? Sorry to ask, but family anecdote isn't going to be enough. Yes, I understand that. Remember those linings in the winter coats? 
My grandmother also got into them the gallery receipts for the Kandinsky, the Delaunay, and the Ruta. That's how my father could prove ownership of the paintings. And one sleeve contained a handful of photographs, including a family group in their parlor. Bloom's carving is clearly visible on a side table. Sounds good. Okay, give me a few days to open negotiations. How do I get in touch with you? I will ring you at the Gazette office. Sure you don't want to arrange a password? Just teasing. I am grateful to you, Miss Fletcher. Call me Abby. I'm on your side now. Bon. Bon. Are you enjoying Theatrephonic's plays? Do you want more content? Well, on the Theatrephonic Patreon, we have ad-free episodes, blooper reels, and Q&A sessions, as well as the opportunity to watch the live recordings and name a character in a play. Visit patreon.com forward slash theatrephonic for more information. That's patreon.com forward slash Theatrephonic to get more of what you love. Bon. Bon. Abby, my office, now. What are you playing at? I've just had the owner chewing my ear. Apparently, Mrs Dudley's complained about you. Typical of her. Don't bother talking to a mere editor first. She says you're involved in this theft from the museum and withholding evidence. That's a complete misrepresentation of the facts. And what are the facts? A man rang me and said he had the carving. And when I met him, he told me it had been stolen from his German-Jewish grandparents by the Nazis. He asked me to liaise with the museum because he wanted to be sure he wasn't prosecuted when he returned it. I went to see Mrs Dudley this morning, but she just shouted at me. Why didn't you tell me all this? I wanted to be able to give you a complete story. Frank, I thought you'd be pleased. I can't tell you how far I am from being pleased. Didn't you listen to anything I told you when you started? You keep me posted on the progress of all stories, large or small. Nothing happens without me knowing about it. That's how it works on this paper. Did you meet this man here? No. On the common. Who did you tell you were meeting him? Uh, no one. So you went and met a complete stranger, probably a crackpot, and nobody knew where you were? I can look after myself. You think you can? But there are plenty of cranks and weirdos about, even in a town like this, and not all of them are harmless. People who confess to crimes they haven't committed to get attention. Newspaper offices are plagued with them. Frank, I believe him. He has proof. You seen it? No, but I don't doubt it's there. There were paintings stolen as well, which his father traced. That's all a matter of record. OK, so he can prove his grandparents once owned the carving. Who's to say they didn't sell it again? And just out of interest, did he have it with him? Did you see it? Well, no, but Frank, if you met him... I don't want to meet him. Ring the police. Here, I've written down the name of the officer dealing with the case. Give her all the details. I'm not going to lead the police to him. What you don't seem to understand is that if a paper obstructs the police, it's the editor who ends up in the dock. I thought protecting sources of information was a fundamental principle of journalism. The fundamental principle of a local paper is to stay in business. You don't do that by antagonising people with influence. So you're just going to kowtow to Mrs Dudley? I'm going to cooperate with the authorities. Give the police this man's name and phone number. I don't know them. He rang here, withheld number, and he asked me to call him Conrad. Probably not his real name. 
Well, give the police a description and report anything he told you. I'm not going to betray him. Suit yourself, but don't come crying to me when you're prosecuted. You just said it's the editor who ends up in the dock. It would be if you were on the staff. But if you don't do as I say, I'll hand you your P-45, cut you loose from the paper and you can sink or swim by yourself. Look, Abby, you're doing well here. Don't derail your career on account of some high-minded idea about journalistic integrity. <coughs> Go back to your desk and think about it. <coughs> Gazette office, Frank Donaldson speaking. Oh, hello, Mr. Bennett. Yes, it's all sorted. It's a misunderstanding by a junior member of staff. Gazette office, Abby Fletcher speaking. It's Conrad, any progress? Bit of a hitch, I'm afraid. Mrs Dudley isn't keen to negotiate. She, well, lost her temper. Abby, I've been thinking. I, I shouldn't have involved you in this. I, I shouldn't be hiding behind you. I, I'll go to the police. No, Conrad, don't do that. I'll think of something. Give me another 24 hours. I can't imagine why you want to see me yet again, Miss Fletcher. I thought it would be courteous to let you know I'm writing a piece on the museum's origins. I've been doing some research. Hmm. You could do that research by looking at the display board in the foyer. From memory, it reads, Nicholas Franklin created the museum in 1952 to give the public access to his collection of art and antiquities. A local history wing was added two years later, showcasing the holdings of the town's archaeology society. Hardly riveting stuff for your readers. I'll be concentrating on the human interest aspect. I've been thinking about that picture I found when I was preparing Nostalgia Corner, the one of Mr Franklin at the opening of the museum. The article didn't say very much about him, apart from praising his generosity. I believe he was a man who valued his privacy. Perhaps with good reason. The paper did say that he was originally from Switzerland, so I rang a friend who works at the National Archives, and he checked their citizenship application records for me, and advised me where to look for wills, marriage and birth certificates, that sort of thing. So now I know that Mr Franklin was born Nikolaus Franzlin in 1900, and that he started using an anglicised version of his name when he moved to Britain in 1948. He married for a second time. Mrs Franklin was English and had three daughters. He was granted British citizenship in 1950. Is this what you call journalism? A few mundane and easily accessible facts, mostly gathered for you by someone else. The most significant mundane fact is that all his working life, whether in Switzerland or Britain, was spent with the family firm. The Franzlins were art dealers. There's a fascinating Wikipedia article about the firm, including how it was repeatedly investigated for trafficking art looted by the Nazis until a fire of unexplained origin conveniently destroyed most of the business records from the 1930s and 40s. How dare you? Don't even think about printing that, Miss Fletcher, unless you want a libel case on your hands. Nicholas Franklin wasn't a Swiss art dealer. Yes, he was, but... I can the... back up everything I've said. The only speculation is around whether Nicholas Franklin knew or cared about Ruta's history and how much more of the collection has a dubious provenance. And the Franklin family has more public interest value. I got quite keen and started mapping out a family tree. The museum is still owned by Nicholas Franklin's two surviving daughters. The third daughter died in the late 1990s, leaving a son who is a successful property developer and runs a company called Jessamine Homes, which I've been looking at for quite a different story. Jessamine Homes surprisingly got planning permission for a clutch of five and six bedroomed houses on the eastern edge of town, despite the land supposedly being earmarked for a new health centre. The accompanying social housing which was on the plans never materialised. The developer's name is Gareth Dudley, but you'll know that, of course, as you're married to him. You would be better suited to some trashy tabloid, Miss Fletcher. The Gazette will never print that drivel. No, it won't. But the Gazette isn't the only newspaper, the only outlet. 
Your influence has its limits, and my story will find a home. What exactly do you want? What I want, Mrs Dudley, is to put that story in the bin and write another, celebrating the return of a beloved exhibit to the Franklin Museum, describing how the museum plans to acknowledge the newly discovered past of the carving. We must recognise that art doesn't exist in a vacuum, untouched by history or politics, said museum director Mrs Alison Dudley. The museum will come out of it as magnanimous and socially aware, but I'll still need a written guarantee that no charges will be brought against my contact. And maybe you'd better include me in that as well. I still don't understand how you got Mrs Dudley to change her mind, Abby. Persuasion, cogent argument and natural charm. All part of the journalist's toolkit. Looked good on the front page, didn't it? The photo of you two either side of the router. Her smile looked a little uh, forced. True, but she was there. So was the new label on Ruta's stand. Apparently, they're going to put an insert into copies of the guidebook until a new edition comes out. Do you think Franklin knew where Ruta came from? Hard to say. Assuming his innocence smoothed the way with Mrs Dudley, do you feel the need to find out? No. I'm satisfied. What surprises me is how much interest there's been. I've been invited to give a talk to the town's history society and one of the schools has asked me to speak to year 12 pupils. I'm not sure about that one. I think the youngsters would find me a rather dry speaker. Go for it, Conrad. You have an important story to tell. Are you going to continue calling me Conrad? If you don't mind, I can't get used to the fact that your name's really Nathaniel. Ah, here's our wine. Thanks. A toast then. To Abby and her first front page story of many. And to Conrad, who gave her a subject worthy of the front page. Mmm, that's good. I'm starving. Shall we order some food? You have been listening to Front Page Story, written by Barbara Jennings, directed by Emmeline Brayfield, with Rebecca Danes as Abby, Jonathan Legg as Conrad, Zoe Cunningham as Alison Dudley, and Anthony Young as Frank. Produced by Cat on a Piano Productions. For a full list of the music in this production, please see the show notes. The Theatophonic theme tune was composed by Jackson Pentland, performed by Jackson Pentland, Molly Fife Taylor and Emmeline Brayfield. For more information about the Theatophonic podcast, go to catonapiano.uk forward slash theatophonic, tweet or Instagram us at theatophonic, or visit our Facebook page. If you enjoy Theatophonic and would like to get more content, please consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash theatophonic. Please don't forget to rate and review. Thank you for listening. Ba -da -ba.